is Ed. I'm with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, I've been there ooh, a little over 25 years now. Wow. Um, I pushed a patrol car around Tahoe for 20 years. Uh, I grew up in Tahoe actually as well. So I've kind of seen it all in regards to, uh, to winter driving and that's what we're here tonight uh, to discuss. Um, how can you avoid being in accidents? Um, how you can stay safe? Keep your cars running, uh, tip-top condition. If you, you know, travel up and down Kingsbury uh, to get to work, uh, those types of things. Um, basically, slow down. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, first thing I'd like to talk to you about is, is what we should be doing right now. It's it's going to snow. We we typically have snow on the ground by now, and we are. Uh, at this point in time, at this point in time in the season, entering the most dangerous road conditions that we come across uh, in the winter. And that is that first snowfall, that first second snowfall that we have. Uh, because typically what happens is everybody is still used to driving 100 miles an hour up and down Kingsbury. And uh, they get that, that first snowfall, uh, the day warms up a little bit, uh, the majority of that snow and ice melts, and you go around a corner at 60 miles an hour, uh, and you hit black ice. And that's, that's when we have our, our most severe and most numerous accidents is during that first couple of snowfalls until everybody gets settled in and used to the idea that I can't drive as fast as I normally do up this hill. And the same thing applies for, for the valley floor as well. Um, so when we do have that snowfall, just keep in mind, uh, just because that road is clear, when you turn that bend, you go around the north side of that hill where it's shady, you cross that bridge that always has the cool air flowing underneath of it, um, that ice is going to be on the roadway and it remains on that roadway a lot longer in those, those, those areas um, as does the, uh, the rest of the highway. So keep that in mind. So anyway, what we should be doing now is preparation of our, of our motor vehicles and a lot of that you're going to learn here uh, in the bays. And do take advantage of that. Uh, they offer some, uh, some great instruction here. Um, don't, do not pass that up. Things to check for uh, is to check your antifreeze and make sure that the level's full, that you have the proper mixture. Um, it's not good to <coughs> spray the antifreeze. Um, you have to have the proper mixture for that to flow properly through through the engine and, and maintain the uh, the temperature of your engine block. Um, you need to change your oil. It's, it's a good time to change the oil uh, going into winter as well as into into the summer. And check your uh, your booklet, your manufacturer recommendations, because sometimes they recommend different weights of oil uh, for summer driving as opposed to winter driving. Make sure you follow those. Don't ask me what the difference is, I don't know, but just follow those recommendations. You need to check all your belts and hoses. Um, if, if anything's going to go wrong, of course it's going to go wrong at the worst point in time that it possibly can, and that means it's going to go wrong during a blizzard. Uh, when it's 20 degrees outside and you're late. That's when something's going to you know, go haywire. So check all those belts, hoses, make sure everything's tip-top condition. You're not going to spring a leak or lose a belt uh, at that time. Check your heater defroster. Make sure you have adequate airflow coming through, that you have no obstructions. Um, make sure you don't have things up on your dash blocking your uh, defroster vents. Um, because uh, I'm sure everyone's been driving down the road and all of a sudden your, your, your windows fog up uh, almost immediately for some reason, you don't know why. A lot of uh, uh, defrosters or cars, they have the, the air intake uh, from the inside, draw air from the inside, and also a switch to draw air from the outside. In the winter time, you need to be drawing that air from the outside. Uh, it will help keep that, uh, that window clear of fog uh, a lot better than drawing that warm air uh, from inside the car. You need to check your battery. They can, they can show you how to do that here. They can do that for you here. Check your wipers. Um, do not wait until you can't clear water or snow from, from your windshield uh, to change your wiper blades. You, you go through a hot summer here, uh, that, that sun plays havoc on, on those rubber blades. So change them during the winter time. Get some, get some decent blades on there. Uh, check your headlights. Make sure that they're working, that they're bright, and that they're you know, pointed, pointed properly, so they're not, you know, one facing up into the trees and uh, the other off to the, off to the left somewhere. Uh, check your emergency flashers front and rear. Turn those emergency flashers on. 
get out of your vehicle and walk around. Make sure that those are, those are flashing. Um, we will talk about tires, but you need to install uh, proper snow tires, carry chains, know how to install those if need be. Um, really, that's, the, that's the, uh, the most important thing that we can do for, for winter driving is, is have good tires because that's what's going to maintain or lose our traction on the roadway on snow and ice. Uh, consider a tune-up if your car is running poorly. Uh, again, now's the time to take care of that so you don't have to do it uh, when the weather is poor. Uh, check your spare tire. Make sure that you know how to change a tire. Uh, and again, this is something that, that Mark and his crew will, will go through with you on how to get that tire out of the trunk. Some people, they, they get lost at, at that point, let alone on how to take all the lug nuts off and how to put, put a new tire on. Um, and also keep fuel in your car during the, during the winter months. Keep it full. Don't, don't take it down to a quarter of a tank or lower uh, before you put gas in it. Uh, the more air that you have in your, in your tank, uh, the more moisture buildup that you will, you will experience. Your car will run rougher. It, it may not start. Um, so if you keep your tank full, you won't, you won't get that, that moisture uh, in there. Um, survival kit. It's a good idea to carry a, a survival kit in your car. Um, in case you slide off the roadway, you get stuck, uh, you could be there for a while, depending on if you leave the roadway. I've actually had, had cases where people have left the roadway, gone up and over the embankment, the guardrail on Kingsbury Gray, uh, and have spent hours and even days in their cars before someone has found them. Uh, you can actually go over the top of a guardrail and not leave a mark. I have seen that occur, so I don't think just because you go over, someone's going to go uh, they went right there. It's not always the case. So I recommend keeping a little survival kit in the car. Keep it in the passenger compartment. If it's in your trunk and you can't get to it, uh, it's going to be all that more maddening to know that it's there and uh, just out of your reach. So, so do keep that in the, uh, in the compartment. Uh, things that I recommend, heavy blankets, sleeping bags, something of that nature. Or like a space blanket too? Yeah, space blanket. Just, just something that should you have to be in your car that, that you can keep yourself warm. Um, I'll discuss some hyperthermia here in a little bit, but uh, that's when, you're, when your body core temperature uh, decreases. If it gets down to about 90 degrees, uh, you actually lose all functioning uh, of, your, of your body. You can't, all, all muscle control and everything else is lost at that point. So it's important to, to maintain, your, maintain your warmth. And anything to keep you warm, big jacket, gloves, hat, uh, things of that nature. And those matches that Waterproof. Water, waterproof, waterproof matches, but you know, if you're striking a match in a car, um, yeah. you, you certainly don't want to be burning anything in the car. I know. Um, I mean, you yeah. Have a big but and, and if we keep our gas tanks full, mm -hmm. we can turn on the car, get some warmth, shut the car off, you know, and then wait a little while to turn the car on. Kind of, kind of use our, our gasoline wisely, but heat the car that way and keep yourselves warm. Uh, high energy bars. Any type of cookies, crackers, things of that nature. Uh, water. Uh, it's a good idea to keep keep some water. Um, and I would recommend getting like a uh, like a little cooler, like a lunchbox cooler type yeah. thing um, that's insulated. And don't don't put an ice block in there or something because it's not going to keep for months. And what we're trying to prevent is it from freezing or from getting too cold. We're trying to prevent that that, that cold from the outside getting inside to our water and freezing that. So. Just store a, store a quick snack uh, lunch box in there uh, with some water, high energy bars, cookies, that type of things. Um, and then you know it's not going to be frozen uh, should you need those. Uh, also a, a flashlight with some spare batteries. Uh, we spoke heavy coat, gloves, hat, boots. Uh, small first aid kit is, is a good idea year round. Um, also cell phones. Most, most everybody has a cell phone. Uh, but the cell phones do not work everywhere, so uh, just kind of keep that in mind. It's not a, it's not a guaranteed safe. Uh, in the trunk of your vehicle, you should have flares. Flares are very important should you, should you slide off the side of the roadway, come upon another accident, uh, something of that nature. You need to be able to, uh, uh, to know how to strike those flares, light them, and get them out on the road to prevent other cars from, from entering your problem that you're experiencing or 
maybe crashing into, a, into somebody it, else. If you had that emergency kit, doesn't it come with it? Some, some emergency kits uh, do have flares in them or they'll have some sort of reflective device. Right. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are battery-operated uh, lights that, that will flash, so we're not <clears throat> having a bunch of lit flares out on the side of the roadways. Um, so there's all kinds of devices out there that are available. Point is, you should have something with you. Uh, a shovel, an ice scraper, of course, and a bag of sand for traction. Um, some people recommend, or you'll hear about cat litter being used. Some cat litters will just absorb moisture, they'll clump, they'll get like a soupy mix, and you're, you're just making things worse when you, when you throw that under your tires to try and gain some traction to, to get going again. So if you're going to do that, use, use some sand, use some nice coarse sand. Uh, they'll get that nice play box because it's almost like you know silt sand. Uh, that won't do you any good. Just get the old cheap sand if you can. Uh, jumper cables and of course tire chains. Make sure that they're the correct chains for, for your tires. And now's the time, like this evening, to make sure that those tire chains fit, uh, that they're the proper proper size for your tires that they go on, and again, that, that you know how to do that, that you can be confident in yourself that should the need arise, you can, you can be out there on the side of the road um, and put those on in the dark. Um, some, are, some are easy and some are a little bit more difficult uh, to install, so get used to what you have um, and again, make sure that, that you know how to do it. Now let's talk about a little bit of winter driving. Uh, before we take off, before we go to work, before we go to school, whatever the case may be, uh, if your car's been parked outside, clear it off, clear all the snow off. Um, I've seen cars, and probably a lot of you have, they got that suit can clearance in the windshield and they're driving 100 miles an hour down the highway. Clear all the windows. Clear the back windows, the side windows, clear the windshield, take the snow off the, off the hood of your car, um, because that can actually blow up and, and into your windshield. Not that it's going to cause any damage, but it could startle you. Uh, you it could cause you to swerve or careen the wheel a little bit. Uh, and any sudden movement like that on, on ice or snow is going to cause your car to, uh, to slide out of control. So clear it off. Clear, clear all your, your, your headlights and your emergency flashers and taillights. Just make sure the car is nice and clean. Um, for those of you that don't, uh, we have a reminder. It's a citation in the amount of $91. Uh, for not clearing your windows, so no. make sure that you make sure that you clear those off. Buckle up. I hope I don't have to remind anybody to always wear your seat belt, uh, but it's it's more important in the winter time. It's the majority of our accidents occur in the winter time, obviously. Uh, if you don't have your seat seat belt on, you're you're subject to uh, to greater injury. Also, slow down. Um, you know, I made a joke about that earlier, but really, you know, if you slow down, give yourself a little bit more room between you and the other vehicles. Uh, you'll never have issue, you'll never have a problem, at, at least not caused by yourself. Um, you just need to be very, very leery of, of others. If, yes ma'am. Um, so how do you handle that when you've got some idiot behind you, right on your butt, and you're slowed I, down, and yeah, what do it, you do? I, I try to allow them to pass. Do you? Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to get, uh, you know, big-headed about it, and this right. is my lane or something. Right. Let them go. And, and that applies winter, summer. Oh, now, all of your movements should be made gently in the vehicle. Again, if you, if, you, if you turn too sharply, you brake too hard, if you accelerate too hard, um, that's going to cause your vehicle to lose traction. And when you lose traction, you're going to do nothing but try and gain uh, and, and fight to, uh, to gain control of, that, of the vehicle again. Um, when you do lose traction of your, of your motor vehicle, you're going to want to turn your wheel in the direction that you want to go. Um, that's the easiest way to remember it. So if you're, if you're spinning out of, out of control this way and you want to get back to the right, back in your traveling, gently turn your wheel to the right um, to bring that vehicle uh, back in a straight path. Intersections are notoriously icy. Um, I, I think what happens is uh, the vehicle stops, say that a, a stop sign or, or a traffic light, they sit there, the warmth from the vehicle, the exhaust, everything else sometimes will melt that snow uh, all the tires are creeping up probably in about the same spot, uh, packing that snow and, uh, and ice down. Um, so those areas, those intersections, they get extremely icy. So when you're approaching an intersection,
be sure to slow down long before you get there um, and anticipate the fact that when I go to step on the brake at the last moment, uh, I'm going to lose control and actually slide all the way through uh, the intersection. He said going out, uh, finding a clear spot and actually cause your car to, to spin a little bit, lose traction, is a good idea just for, just for practice. Uh, so you can learn how to correct it immediately um, and not make the situation worse. It's also important with front wheel drive uh, vehicles, when, you, when the drive wheels in the front uh, are supplying the power, uh, you actually accelerate to actually gain control, gain traction again on your, on your vehicle. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not brake and slow down uh, like on a rear wheel on a motor vehicle you actually have to accelerate a little bit. So you need to go out and you need to practice that and get the feeling of that. Um, also, uh, if, you're, if you're traveling up Kingsbury, get to work, what have you, there's a sign at the bottom that says, change of snow tires required. Uh, don't decide to wait till the last minute to, to get those chains on. Uh, pull over, there's, there's ample place to park at the bottom of the hill. So often when I was on patrol, we would have people, they, they would try and make it as far as possible. Uh, just to try to avoid putting on chains. And, and what, what occurs is they endanger their lives, they endanger other lives and property, uh, because they get so far they have to stop right in the middle of the roadway. Uh, we have a citation for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a lot more expensive, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's about twice as much. Um, don't wait to the last minute. Just take them at their word. NDOT knows what they're doing. Um, and pull over and get those chains on. And when you do that, make sure that you're off the roadway. Uh, I've seen people who have had their legs run over uh, because they've been on the side of the road putting on chains uh, with their legs hanging out. Um, it, right Again, right in the middle of the road putting on chains. Uh, it's just crazy, it's just crazy. So is it a misnomer, like supposing you have snow tires and stuff, you still have to put chains on? If it says chains or snow tires on the sign and you have snow tires, and I like to wheel some snow tires out, or uh, you get quick set chains and things of that nature. If it says snow tire on it, M&S, mud and snow, right. um, those qualify as a, as a snow tire. Are like how about an altar? Yeah. Well, those are those are pretty gr aggressive tires, and they'll probably say uh, like yeah, MNS or something of okay, that nature so for mud and snow. So again, don't don't wait to the last minute. And again, uh, take advantage of of these folks here to, to show you how to apply chains on your on your motor vehicle. Uh, you know, if you if you don't have like say a, a four wheel drive or something of that nature, where you're going to absolutely need them, I guarantee at some point in time. Uh, would you like to go through this trip? Sure. Most everybody, especially in our area, ha has a basic all season or basic mud and snow. Um, in northern Nevada, there's really not a lot of uh, people that actually carry tires that aren't basic mud and snow. Um, your biggest difference between a straight snow tire and a mud and snow, though, is going to be the rubber compounds, the amount of siping and traction that you will have in the cold, wet conditions. Then you also move up into a studded snow tire. Okay, this is great for summertime use, year-round use, you can do it, but if you plan on traveling in the wintertime, you're better off going with a straight snow, okay? This one isn't made to run year-round, it's made to run summer, wintertime only. It's made of a softer rubber compound so that it's not as rigid when the weather is cold and you're on ice. That's what gives you a little better stopping ability, a little better traction in the snow. Your studded tires is a tire like this. These are great snow tires. The studs are actually going to help you mostly in ice. Okay, especially if you drive Kingsbury on a regular basis. Because even on days where we don't have any snow whatsoever, but we've had snow a couple weeks prior, they get runoff up there. And it comes across, there's a couple corners up there that it comes across. As soon as the sun goes down, it freezes. Okay, these little studs here, these little spikes, that's what's going to bite into that ice. They're not foolproof, but it's as close as you're going to get with these. Now, on rear-wheel drive cars, you could run just studs on the rear. However, we generally recommend doing all four. And on a front-wheel drive car, the only way we do them is to do all four. And the reason for that is, is that these do grab in the ice. If you do hit a patch of ice and you're braking, 
these front tires will grab. There's nothing to keep that back end of that car from coming around on you. So we do do four on the front wheel drives, two on the rear wheel drives if you insist. But the, what if you have an all wheel drive? All wheel drive, all the tires have to match. Regardless if it's a straight mud snow, a straight snow tire, or a studded snow tire. Your transmission's trying to keep all four wheels going the exact same speed. All four tires have to be identical. Same manufacturer, same tread design uh, has to be on the vehicle all the way around. Yes. What's sniping? Sniping is actually a 90 degree cut that's in the tire. Okay? Some of your snow tires come with siping in it. Siping is also something that outfits do. We do it here. And it's simply where we take an existing tire and we cross cut it. What it does is it actually gives you more edges for traction, more ways to, to uh, allow the water or moisture to escape. Because the film of water between the rubber and the road is hydroplaning, basically. It doesn't matter how thin it is, you don't have contact fully with that road. So the more siping that's in the tire, the faster that water is going to get out from between the tire and the road, which is what gives you the traction. Yes, ma'am. Can you um, have the tires you have on your car right now siped? You definitely can. Um, I, 730 seconds is a minimum, and you can sipe uh, straight snow tires, all season tires, pretty much any tire you want, you can sipe them. Now, yeah. does that mean it's only good for winter or? No, actually, actually this is a benefit in the summertime too because it allows more airflow through the tire which creates less friction which can cause longer tire wear because friction is actually what wears your tire off. I've been running side tires on my county car for about two and a half years now and wintertime, summertime I've never had an issue. When we side them we actually don't remove rubber from the tire, okay? It's simply a cut. Straight cut. If you bend that over, you see what I'm talking about. Can you bend the same to get Sure can. We don't actually remove the rubber. Now, in order for them to sipe it from the factory into mold, they'd actually have to put a piece in the mold to cause a void in the rubber. So that's the reason they don't sipe them like that from the factory. Your snow tires do have siping in them. That there is. You know, three times the amount of siping is what comes out of the mold. It's better than? It's an added benefit, yes. So you can drive around on snow tires all year long? You can, but if you're going to do a lot of traveling in the wintertime, okay, if you're the type of person that gets up in the morning and looks out and says, wow, there's snow on the ground, I'm staying home, great. If you're the type of person that has to be from point A to point B on a regular basis, a straight snow tire would definitely benefit you more. And you can't run year-round on a studded right. tire. Stud, no. right? no. There is there's times that they can come on and off, which is April 3rd, or excuse April me. April 30th. I, I started with taking them off. October 1st to April 30th, they have to come on. Yes. It is. We have, a, we have a reminder for that as well. Yes. If, we, if we have um, California folks here, it actually goes off even sooner. It does. Yeah. How expensive is this siping? Siping actually isn't very expensive at all. It runs about thirteen fifty per tire. Oh. It's not. It's it's a, yeah, it's a, a fairly inexpensive way to add quite a bit of traction. Yeah, you do anticipate that. No, one, no one's ever heard the term black ice before. Like, it's just where the where the ice freezes so clear um, and so smooth that it looks like pavement. Um, Nevada has a term called poco net. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've heard of that, yeah. Which is uh, the Nevada form of black ice. Really? Yes. Yeah. Well, isn't Pogos. that when all the little, every, every uh, ranch on a tree is covered with snow? With ice. With ice, yeah. The yeah. ice crystals yeah. form on yeah. pretty much it looks everything. Like yeah. Okay, if you have regular tires on your car and you get them siped, are they basically then considered a snow tire? They are not. No. Not, in order for, not without that stamp. Yeah, in order so for it to be a snow tire. If they were stopping you somewhere, you couldn't say, my tires are siped and they wouldn't let you through then. No. Okay. In order for it to be a uh, mudded snow, there's actually a stamp on the side of your tire that is stamped M&S. And you said most of your tires are that, no matter what? Yes. Really? But 
if you have your vehicle here, we can definitely take a look at it for you. And I can tell you if your vehicle's yeah, months. We buy almost all our tires from you guys. I'll check them out. And if you bought them here, more likely yes. But otherwise, swing by. It only take a moment. I can show you exactly what the highway patrol will be looking for. Uh, if you are involved in an accident, um, don't stop in the middle of the road to exchange information with with the other driver. Uh, if you can, get off the roadway. If it means traveling down the road a little bit uh, to find a safe place to pull over, uh, then do so. Um, just keep in mind, if you lost traction there or if the other driver lost traction there and crashed, everyone else behind you is going to do the same thing. Um, if you are unable to actually physically drive your vehicle from the spot, stay inside your vehicle. Uh, if you are out of your vehicle, out and about, walking in the roadway, uh, another car can come down the highway, slam into the, the back of you or slam into the back of another car, and you could be pinned between two, two motor vehicles. So stay inside your car. Turn on the emergency flashers. If you have a cell phone, you can call uh, 911. Uh, get law enforcement there right away. Um, if, you, if you feel that, that you can do so safely, get out. Let's put those, flare out, those flares out. Um, don't worry about your, your flare pattern or if you're doing it right. Uh, just get them lit and get them out there to, to warn the other drivers. Keep in mind, it's not necessarily going to slow everybody down. They don't care that there's a hundred flares out there in the roadway, uh, red lights flashing. I've had people drive over literally 50, 50 flares, cones, uh, everything else just to try and run me over. Um, so just, just remember that it's not going to slow everybody down. It's not a it's not a safety net, but do get those out there. You were talking about um, if you go into a skid, you turn into the skid. Does it make any difference if you have an all-wheel drive car as to opposed to a real, rear wheel? Not, not that I'm aware of. I don't think. Actually, it, it does. There's um, there's actually a couple cars on the road right now. The Subaru SVX. 16% of them actually end up in the junkyard before they get about 25,000 miles on. And it's simply because of that reason. They've incorporated what they call yaw control. Basically, the car starts applying the brake on opposite corners <coughs> and it feels that you're getting ready to go into a slide. Oh. Once again, if you do take your take your foot off the <coughs> accelerator and hit the brake, it shuts the computer down. Um, it's something that's fairly new though. I don't I, we see very few of them. Um, best idea is Give yourself that little bit of extra practice, maybe, um, on a you know a clear area to see how your car is going to handle, because um, <laughs> you're incorporating a lot of new technology with the cars, and basically there's a lot of safeties in them that are applying brakes, that are actually dampening steering, doing a lot of different things that I don't think we really got great answers for right now. Um, it's, you know, some people say you turn into it if you don't have ABS, and you don't if you do have ABS, I mean, so it is kind of debatable, mm. especially on the newer vehicles. Nothing like a little experience. Yeah. 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 One other thing, quickly, they brought these chains out. Um, when, when you go to purchase tire chains, make sure that you buy chains. Um, not those little plastic things or the wire. Uh, Anyone seen those little wire cable chains? Yeah, those don't, don't work. Don't, don't no, don't. Uh, I won't <laughs> recommend them. I don't. I don't believe Mark will sell them here. Um, you'll see those. You'll see those littering the highways uh, in the wintertime because they're just prone to go a couple miles down the road, snap, uh, fly off. You're lucky if they fly off and not wrap around your axle. Um, so, so purchase a purchase a good set of uh, chains. And these are a quick set. This is a quick fit chain. Your top speed on any chain, regardless of whatever traction device, is about 25 miles an hour. So purchase a, a good pair of chains, know how to install them, know how to get those on uh, should, should the need arise. And please, please, please don't wait till it snows to do these things. Start preparing now, because when it snows here, we'll have cars lined up down 395 trying to get in here for us to take care of them. And the guys will do work the hardest they can to take care of everybody, but we just get overwhelmed. So start early and stay ahead of it. Get some practice and you'll be fine.
painter. I've been painting on silk for probably about five years. Uh, before that, I worked in watercolor and pen and ink. But the draw for me for, with silk painting is the, in, the incredible color, the brilliance, the uh, vibrancy. It's just a wonderful form of art, very unpredictable, and it just grabbed me by the soul and took me away. So I want to show you a few things uh, about silk painting. Uh, of course, you paint on silk. Uh, you stretch your silk at all times. I've transferred a uh, line drawing to, to my silk and I've started putting the resist on, on this one. The resist is uh, meant to stop the movement of the dye and contain the, the color. This, this method of silk painting is called surti uh, and that means closed fence. So let's, let's work on this a little bit. Let's find our glasses too. So. Every fiber of the silk has to be penetrated or the, or the dye will move through it and you'll have a lot of migration of color. And it, it just moves on. You, you kind of treat it like, like you would a, an ink pen. You get to create these great little fences and this will hold the dye in. This silk is, is 12 mommy is the, the description of the, of the type of silk. It's a habitai, and it's a little heavier than handkerchief silk, which is usually eight mommy. And this one will hold more dye, and you'll get more richness of color. And so you'll get more vibrant colors also. It'll take a while for the resist to dry. Once it's dry, you can start applying your colors. These are steam set dyes, and they need to be processed in a steamer, which is, my steamer is about as tall as I am. It's a cylinder, and the silks are hung inside the, the steamer for four to six hours so that the dye bonds with the silk, makes it light fast, and washable if you're interested in washing it. And I'll check, before I start pinning this one, I'll check and make sure that all the lines connect and all the lines are thick enough that, that we don't have any, any uh, holes in them for the dye to migrate through. Okay. This one is ready to dry and start painting. Okay, we're ready to start painting now. And uh, you use the same techniques, a lot of the same techniques that you use in watercolor. You use washes, you use water to control the flow of the dye. So I've just applied some clear water on there and now I'm gonna put some color on and let the color flow into it. I saw my first silk painting about five years ago. It was uh, after a very difficult time in my life where I spent a year taking care of my husband who had leukemia. Uh, we had we'd always kind of kidded around about what I would be in my next lifetime. I always I thought there must be an easier way to do it than what we're doing in this lifetime, so I was just planning on the next one. Had to have something to do with animals preferably something to do with art. And I had pretty much settled on, on being a portrait painter, paint animal portraits. Well, after he passed away, and about a month into trying to recover from really just the absence of him, I saw my first soap painting. I saw a little newspaper article in the paper promoting a, a demonstration by a local artist, a Tahoe artist. She was giving a demonstration at the library here in, in Gardnerville or Minden. Um, and I went to the demonstration. It was given for the Carson Valley Art Association. I didn't belong to the Art Association, but I kind of crashed the meeting and pushed my way in front of a lot of sweet little old ladies and stood there and watched the magic happen. 
And I was so excited and overwhelmed by this, I just absolutely had to figure out how to do it. And that wonderful artist, A.D. Chernus, has become a very good friend of mine. She works and teaches up at, at the South Shore of Tahoe and is very active with silk painting still up there. And we've become great friends, done a lot of workshops together. And she has led me on a great path. Before that, I, I, uh, I started doing pen and ink drawings when I was 12 years old and my mom would sell them. And uh, in college, I put myself through school throwing pots, throwing mugs for, ten, or mugs for 15 cents and bowls for 10 cents. First things were pretty reasonable back then and it didn't take a whole lot to put me through school. I was studying to be an English lit teacher and I discovered that just because you like reading books doesn't make you a good teacher. And you see that I've still had some migration of dye across the lines. This form of painting, if you're a control freak, you're, you're kind of dead in the water because things are always going to happen and you just have to kind of roll with the flow at times. And so I used to worry about things like the dye moving across a line, I don't worry about it anymore. I just kind of look forward to what new trip it'll take me on. Generally, I put down three or four layers of color. Sometimes I underpaint different tones, different textures. We're kind of moving fast today, so I'm not going to do too many coats here. Is a very exciting medium. It's, it's a little out of control, a lot of serendipity happens. And as long as you're open to the change, then it's a really great thing. I live out in Fish Springs and uh, I still get to see wild horses on a real regular basis. One of the great things about living in western Nevada. And they're very inspirational. One night, we'd forgotten to close the gates, and we'd left a, a water trough full for our youngest grandson to play in. And I heard the horses out front, and I thought, oh no, they're going to go down the hill and break their legs on the terraced walks there. So I ran out, left the dogs in the house, and kept the lights off and went out, walked, walked beyond them and kind of shuffled them all, all out the gate. It was one of the nicest things that ever happened to me, feeling all of those big warm bodies going by me in the night, hearing them kind of snuffle and talk, feeling their movement all around me. I'm very blessed out here. I'm going to move on to the background right behind the horses. I'm going to do a fun thing there. I said that the, we use a lot of techniques very similar to watercolor, and one of the things that, that I use uh, to provide texture is salt. Salt will react with the dye and separa separate out the colors that make up an individual dye and leave all sorts of texture around. So. The salt has to be applied when the, when the dye is wet, so we'll get a couple of areas working in here. We can salt. You see how the, I always try to stay away from the lines and let the dye move to the line. When this dries, it'll put a great texture in there, provide a great place for your eye to move to. So 
So when I make a mistake like I just made, don't panic too much about it. I'll just kind of go with it. I put my, my green over that, that bit of red. And if you can't hide an error, the best thing to do is make it show up. So to make it show up, I'll add some more red. Go back in these areas and salt them again so that we have a consistent look. And that's that's how the dye is applied. My name is Louise Noel House. I'm a silk painter. I'm showing you my paintings today at Artistic Viewpoints Gallery in Gardnerville, Nevada. Um, I'm a Gardnerville resident, live, live out in Fish Springs, have lived down here for 20-some years. I uh, love the area, love silk painting. This painting is my most recent horse painting. It's called A Horse of a Different Color. And uh, of course the inspiration from this for this one was uh, this fall, which was absolutely gorgeous. And, of course, my, my friends, the, the wild horses again. Um, I took my artistic license and took them, I took my horses on a little trip up to Hope Valley. And they're, they're there running through the, through the aspens and uh, you get to see the, the creek running through. And it's, it's a very joyful piece, lots of color, leaves falling. It's, it's a very exciting, exciting piece for me. These little horses, they, they come into my paintings really frequently. They, they change shape and form and, and order, and uh, they've been great pals for me, and I've, I've, I've used them quite frequently. Uh, not, only, not only do I spend a lot of time chasing the wild horses around where, where I live, out in Fish Springs, but I'm involved with the Kids and Horses Therapeutic Writing Center also, um, a great program that, that uh, takes kids with disabilities um, on rides, gives them great confidence, gives them something that they can actually control. Um, all, all staffed by volunteers. We have a few paid, paid employees there, the program manager, the equine manager, um, and the office manager. But the rest of us are volunteers. We, we freely donate our time for the horses and for the kids. I, uh, I handle horses for, for the program on Tuesdays. I have three regular students. This, this painting is called Night Herd. And this is uh, from the same set of drawings that you saw me working on earlier. Uh, this one, I decided, just felt like a, a night scene. And the, the horses are standing there on their, on their little background, river flowing through it. Initially, when I very first, the very first time I, I, I did the drawing for this, I, I had it pictured as kind of a, uh, just a, a sky scene in the back. And when I started painting, or actually I started doing my resist work, the, the clouds that I had drawn in looked more like, like mesas, and so I let them be. And it, it turned into a, a very nice Southwest painting. And so this one, again, is called Light Herd. This, this painting is called Free Range. Uh, it's, a, it's a Carson Valley painting. And again, there's my little herd of wild horses there. And this one I wanted to, to uh, involve some close-up guys. So we, uh, I drew in some, some horses in the foreground and uh, I took a little bit of artistic license there. You don't see too many horses with stars in their coat. Another one of my joys is gardening. And I, I love poppies. And so I, I grow all sorts of poppies in my garden. I grow California poppies and oriental poppies. I grow corn poppies. Um, these are, are uh, my version of oriental poppies. I, I love the, the big, bold flowers and the, and the rough foliage they have. And so, of course, I've taken a few liberties because you don't see too many checkerboard centers in flowers. But, but um, th this, is the, this is the joyful way in which I, I view them. And these poppies, the, uh, I, I go out and do studies in, in my garden. I'll, I'll sit there and, and just draw the shapes of flowers. And, and play with them a little bit, take the drawings down to my studio, 
and then just move them around and, and uh, eventually I come up with something that, that flows really nicely. Again, the color is so vibrant and so lively. Uh, it is, it's a spectacular medium for, for colorful, colorful art. This, this painting is called All in Our Places. Um, the old children's song about all in our places with sunshiny faces crossed my mind. You know, naming, naming my paintings is, is one of the joys, too. I, I, uh, I, often, I often just read something into the painting. I, I, I see something funny in it. I, I, like to, I like to have a little humor with my paintings. But I let them speak to me and, and pretty much name themselves. This little painting is called Dancing in the Dark. And it's, as you can see, it's very similar to the last poppy painting, uh, some of the same types of flowers in there. I did this one as a demonstration piece when I was doing a show in Sacramento this fall. Uh, the promoter gave me a fantastic spot, didn't charge me very much, but made me promise him that I would demonstrate for three days. So I took, I took uh, the drawing for this one, uh, did the resist work at the show, and for three days I puttered along on, on this this painting, uh, I, I found uh, during the first day that I'd only brought about half of my dyes, so I was a little bit limited in color. And it didn't, didn't bother me too much as I was doing the foliage and as I was doing the flowers, but when it came down to making the decision about the background, I needed a color that would tie everything together. And I had nothing in my palette except for black that would do that. And I'd never painted a black background on my florals before, and so this was the first time I'd, I'd tried that. And I just thought the results were remarkable. It just made the flowers pop forward, uh, become very exciting. Uh, of course, there's, there's three days' worth of painting on those flowers, so they have a great deal of detail. But it, it turned out to be a very exciting and precious little piece. It's called Dancing in the Dark. This little painting is one of my favorites. It's called Coffee House. And it's evolved over the years. Um, it started as a, as a sketch on a little scrap of paper. I was doing a show in the Bay Area, and on Sunday morning, shows always start a little quietly. Uh, people arrive late. Everyone's around. All the artists are around visiting one another. And um, several friends had been in my booth visiting and, and drinking coffee. And when they all departed, they'd all left their coffee cups uh, stacked in the back of my booth on my little work table. And they were so charming, I just had to, to make a quick sketch. I carried, carried the sketch around for about two years until the painting came into my mind. And um, so Coffee House emerged from, from that one day at the show. This most recent version uh, came about uh, when my, my cat decided to come help me draw one day. I was, I was drawing on the silk, the, the Coffee House scene, and uh, Indiana Jones plumped himself down on my light table and just took up a lot of space and announced that he wanted to be part of the, the, the painting. So I had to move the guitar over a little bit and build him a chair and put him into the painting. So Indiana Jones got to be part of Coffee House, this particular version. named this painting Passing on the Magic. And it began life um, in a workshop up at Tahoe, uh, taught by my, my instructor and my mentor, um, A.D. Chernus, who still is teaching through Lake Tahoe Community College and also through the Art League up at uh, South Shore. Um, A.D. gave out an assignment for this workshop that was uh, to paint an insect. And uh, it was a two-week workshop solid two weeks, right in the middle of my busy season. So I was trying to make every painting count and uh, point it towards my business. I went home kind of muttering to myself that, you know, I had to paint an insect. I couldn't figure out how I could use that. I ended up drawing out and, and doing all the prep work for a, a kind of a goofy butterfly over some tulips. Um, did, did everything I needed to do, put it, put it in the truck. Um, that night, went to sleep and then I dropped this painting. Woke up in the morning and still had the, the, the picture of the painting in my head, and I thought, oh no, now I've got to deal with this. So I went down to the studio, did all the prep work, still got up to the lake by 9 o'clock, and uh, 80 comes by and, 
and takes a look at the, the painting as it's progressing, and she says, oh, okay, what are you calling this one? And I said, well, it's got a working title, 80, and that's Chasing 80, which I felt like I'd been doing for about three or four years at that point. And I said, but it's, it also has a, a, a real title, and that's Passing on the Magic. Uh, the people who bought the versions of this have always been very interesting people to me. Generally, they work with their hands. I had uh, people who were hand therapists, um, nurses, and one, ma one magician bought one of these. So uh, it's been ex exciting painting to, to carry with me and to see who, who claims them. This painting is called uh, Old Coyote. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to spend a little time down in Arizona uh, doing shows and, and poking around in Santa Fe and, and out in those, those areas. And uh, love, love the Southwest, love the gorgeous skies, love, love the Pueblos. It, it, everything just lends itself to, to silk painting. This one has a little storyboard around it where it, it uh, has this wonderful symbolism. And, uh, I sold, I sold the painting and, and the, the lovely man who, who bought it asked me, he says, well, are these, are these Indian symbols? I said, oh, I, I can't quite take somebody else's symbolism, so they're all my symbols. I, the sun and the moon, the stars, fish, the, the little birds, the open hands, you know, they, they, all, uh, they all bring me right back into the painting. So I, I just wanted to share those and put them in this painting called Old Coyotes. This painting is called Southwest of Here. And again, it's uh, inspired by the Pueblos and, and the scenery of, of, of Arizona and New Mexico. Um, you can see all the salt techniques used in, in this painting. You can see the washes, the, the light yellow wash put in the background before I ran the dyes of red and purple into it. Um, around the border, I, I really tried to weather the, the painting by underpainting lots of different colors, uh, lots of dark colors, and then putting probably three layers of, of, of the red dye over that and then salting it on the last layer. The red dye is really a wonderful dye that I, I found this winter, this past winter. Uh, it helped me get through winter with, with joy and uh, excitement. Uh, the first layer, however, I put on was a uh, came out kind of a, of a cherry red and was a little disappointing. And the second layer turned into kind of a bar red and that wasn't really what I had in mind. The, the third layer turned into this great, great red. And it, it provided a lot of excitement through, through the winter for me. Uh, the only problem was that almost every painting I turned out for three months was red. I had to finally put an end to it and say, let's just use this a little bit. This painting is called North of Cave Rock. And uh, it is, I believe this was the very first Tahoe uh, painting I, I, I ever did, um, the very first version of it. And um, it was uh, brought about by finding a little picture my dad took in about 1954. Um, it's a little tiny black and white picture. Uh, he'd taken me up to uh, see where his family was raised in Virginia City, and we'd stopped um, at Cave Rock area, and we'd hiked down, and uh, he took this picture. Um, and so this is my version of it. Uh, I added in the, the poppin, poppies and lupin. Uh, I'm allowed to do that because I'm, I am an artist, and, and it is my world. But it's a, it's, a, it's a delightful painting. I got to do lots of cloud reflections in the water. Uh, played with color, played with salt, uh, got the great Tahoe blue sky and the Tahoe blue lake. It's a, it's a fun picture and it, it was the very first one that this gallery ever sold for me, the Artistic Viewpoints. Um, I think the very first month they were open a few years ago, uh, Bill had been up at, at Tahoe fishing on, a, on a, fi a charter fishing trip, met some people, drug them down here to his gallery and uh, they went home with, with one of my paintings. So. I, uh, it has a very special place in my heart. This painting is called Above Emerald Bay. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here is, uh, is Emerald Bay, Finette Island, uh, the view across the lake, the great Tahoe skies again. And it's a perfect medium for, for doing Tahoe skies. 
Uh, you get you get the movement, the the washes just blend into each other, the salt gets everything mixed around there, and you just get fantastic color. Um, the poppies and the lupin, well, in the real world, they may not bloom at the same time, but but in this painting there, there they are. Um, it's an exciting painting, a little, uh, little license taken with colors of trees and all, but, but uh, it expresses my feelings about, about Tahoe and the love I have for the area. I, I can still remember kayaking across the, the mouth of Emerald Bay and, and trying to, to beat the speedboats so that they didn't, didn't squash our little trail of about eight kayaks going across there. Sure have been filming lots of love. I've been growing my hair for an extremely long time to donate it to some kid because uh, my girlfriend had cancer as a child and she wore wigs for a lot of years until I met her and said don't go don't wear any more wigs. But to my beautiful locks of hair, I thought what the hey, I'll grow my hair and donate it to a kid, like uh, my Deborah. And that's what we're doing. Young Terry Moore here has decided to uh, be my instructor on getting rid of this hair and donating it to a young kid. That's perfect. Major part of it for the lots of love. We're going to contribute this hair right here. Excellent. Okay, and I'm just going to cut the beard up and give him a nice clean look. This is uh, Michael Smith. We have just finished donating my hair to Lots of Love, and uh, Terry Moore says I look like a new person, which I I feel lighter, and I certainly hope this uh, can be turned into a wig for a kid, and that more people will come and donate their hair as well. This is Michael Smith reporting from Sheer Heaven in Garnerville. Thank you.